Hello boys and girls, Navin out on No Limit Hold'em. Uh, this is uh, going to be something a little bit different. This is starting into the second hand. The first hand wasn't very, uh, I don't think it was any big deal. Um, mm, well, there it is. Um, so, we're playing against a guy named Chris, who is, um, he's been playing a long time. Uh, I guess he just got like a $10 gift card or something so that he was able just to buy into these micro stakes and um, I've been doing the run it up from nothing part two so I just started with frequent player points and am currently hovering around $21 something like that um, second time second time around okay so um, let's get into it so um, Starting on this, what I'm going to be doing is kind of critiquing my play, and then also looking for spots where I feel like um, Chris could have maybe improved his play. Okay, so his three bet sizing as a min raise at these stacks is not accomplishing much. I think it's kind of bad out of position. He three bets and he checks his pre flop raise on King Jack Nine. I think that either means that he is one of three things: trapping, hoping for a check raise, uh, or he has showdown value that he's uh, trying to get to showdown or um, he's uh, just giving up because you know, the board maybe he feels like hits too much in my range so when he calls on the turn um, I think we can barrel a decent amount trying to fold him off of like ace nine would be a, a pretty good guess for the type of pain you might have or like pocket tens no that doesn't make sense pocket uh, eights maybe which is what he actually ended up having, but um, since we actually did improve on the river, then we can obviously just try to size our bet to get value from that you know weaker bluff catcher type range. Um, I think, by the way, he probably could have just uh, either turned his hand into a bluff on the flop, um, or uh, check called uh, the turn. Or bet the turn, but in any case, I don't like his uh, call on the river. But he doesn't know anything about me, so you know. Um, another thing I feel like he was doing in this match a lot was limp folding. I think he had uh, an, an exploitable limp fold percentage. Okay, so we're gonna open Jack Eight off on the button. He defends. Um, we have. You know, bottom pair, and I think we could bet that for value, trying to get uh, value from ace x or smaller pairs, but I think checking back is okay too. Um, it kind of depends on whether we expect him to be more aggressive um, with his air, or if we expect him to be more like stationary with his ace highs and small pairs. Um, I made the fold here, but looking back on it, I think it would have been a pretty okay call, because I'm not expecting him to have any aces. Uh, I just don't think he plays aces that way, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think I had a call there. It's probably pretty bad fold. Okay, limps and leading this flop seems just fine. I don't want to check fold. I don't want to check call. So we just bluff with the overcard. Five four, fine open. Um, he donk leads into me. If we have any equity at all, I think we can go for like a raise here because usually when players uh, see a flop that favors the pre-flop raisers range or is neutral as is the case in that last flop, they don't have a lot of incentive to donk. They're strong hands and so you'll usually see them donking uh, bluffs and especially semi-bluffs and there were enough draws there uh, that I could have expected him to be donking as a semi-bluff, but if I had some equity, I could have uh, raised as a bluff, but I just didn't have anything, so I just bowed out. Ace-5 offsuit, obviously going to open this. Um, so, so far, I think um, he's been 3-betting a little bit tight, which, um, you know, is probably still looser than what I tend to 3-bet at the micro stakes, but um, I think it means that I can fold Ace-5 offsuit. Just, it's an exploitative fold. Um, or I think the other thing to do would be to 4-bet with it, but I think I need more reads on Villain to make a play like that. 
Uh, 5-3 offsuit I think is a fold, especially if we think we're getting 3-bet uh, a decent amount and we're not getting any folds. Um, now, I was just thinking in-game here that I've been playing pretty tight all at once and it may look like I've changed my strategy up a little bit, so I didn't want to 3-bet King-Queen because I didn't think he'd call with enough second-best hands. Um, but check calling with the two over cards, back to our flush draw, and that flop seems just fine. Now I think uh, we can call or we can raise, and I think both options are okay. But based on <clears throat> the read that I had, that he would probably be sensing me shifting into a tighter strategy. I feel like in this kind of metagame situation, going for the check raise is probably best. Um, the one thing I think I goofed up there, I made a lot of mistakes. We were, um, I, I was a little bit distracted, but I made a lot of mistakes. The one mistake I made there is I raised uh, wanting a fold, and I didn't go all in, but I did stick myself and commit myself to the pot. And that's always a mistake. Like if I am raising and giving him the option to set me all in, and I have to call, and I want him to fold, and I think I should have just went all in myself. Here we've just got some, you know, obvious showdown value that uh, I don't see any real options other than to check it back and hope to win against his no pair hands. Um, Ace King, obviously we're going to raise here, but he's been limp. He did a lot of limp for me. So, Chris, one thing I would uh, caution against is limp folding exploitably. Um, and a big cautionary note, if you're playing against a pretty reasonable player, um, you, uh, you don't want to make your first limp a weak limp that's going to limp and fold. Because even if you think, well, <clears throat> I'm going to open a limp range because I want to limp this hand, then I'll just balance it with big hands if he starts becoming aggressive against my limps. Well, okay, that may be true moving forward, but it's rarely true on the first limp because... If you've been raising everything and then all at once you're dealt pocket aces, you're just not going to do that, right? You're not going to just decide, well, uh, I'm going to limp these aces uh, so that I can balance a limp, uh, open limping range. That's not how, I mean, it, it rarely is the case that people do that. So I think good regs will tend to uh, be pretty aggressive against your first open limp. But not aggressive enough that I think you should actually open limp aces. Uh, if you've been raising every hand. So just don't open limp a weak hand, but also don't open limp um, aces. Um, if you're going to open a, a limping range on the button, do it with suited connectors that can call a raise would be my uh, advice, at least for the first the first go. Um, I think that was real super close there. You put me in a tough spot. Um, probably ranged me fairly correctly and thought I had a lot of exactly what I did have in my range, but I just, I think my flush draw is just dominated too often to make that call profitable here. Um, I think that even at the turn, I don't think I can bet and get called by um, too much worse, uh, but there's probably some draws, and I think you can have a lot of 6x in your range, so um, I think betting for kind of thin value against your worst 7s um, your sixes that checked back uh, is okay, but pretty thin. And I think the other way to play it would have been for me to check and call the turn. Um, or uh, check, and if it checks through, then um, make the decision to check, call, or value bet thin myself on the river. Okay, so I think this is a spot where you donk butt into me. Um, and I think you're doing that very imbalanced. I think that when you're donking, you are donking with draws, and you're donking with air and weak hands, and uh, I think it's very exploitable. Uh, so there's the air that you're donking with. Um, and if you're not familiar with the term, Pris or, or whoever's watching, donking just means to lead into the pre-flop raiser on the flop out of position. So you call the raise out of position pre-flop and then you bet into me on the flop. Um, it usually doesn't make a lot of sense to do that, especially in heads up poker. But I mean, there are situations where it can be good to open a donking range. But if you think your opponent is c-betting uh, like too much, um, then you should never donk. You know, if you knew your opponent was going to see about the flop, you'd literally have no incentive to bet it yourself because you'd want to uh, check and allow me to bluff if you have a mediocre marginal hand. It's the only way you can get value out of it. 
and you would want to uh, check your strongest hands if you knew I was going to bet to either check call or check raise for value. Um, and so if the only thing you really have incentive to donk into me with are bluffs and semi-bluffs, then you become very easy to play against if that's all your donk betting. It seems like that was um, all your donk betting. So um, if you want to have a range that leads into the preflop raiser on the flop as the preflop caller out of position, you should probably do that on boards where you think it's likely I'm going to check back a lot. And uh, you should do it with a balanced range. Like here's another example. And you did put me in a tough spot because I just happen to have like a, a jack in it too. It's awful. But I just don't think you'd make this. I mean, why are you moving 700 into 200 if you have like ace king? Why not check to the razor? <clears throat> Let me bet. You can still get... Uh, stacks in by betting turn and jamming river, no problem if I check the flop back. So I just think this is a very um, face up semi bluff, and I just have to decide if I want to uh, pretty much flip against it. I don't think you're doing that with sets, I don't think you're doing that with two pairs like ever, and I don't think you should. Um, so again, if you're not going to be leading into the pre flop raiser with like two pair, top pair, top kicker, and if you're not going to do it with your mediocre showdown value that's going to play better as bluff catchers against my continuation bets, then you can't just do it with your bluffs and semi-bluffs or you become too predictable when you uh, make that lead. And you can see from my perspective now that I was able to figure that out pretty quick because it's really the first thing that comes to mind. I think that most players when they're donking the preflop raiser are imbalanced towards, they're weighted very heavily towards draws and then they're going to have air and then like weak made hands behind that and uh, very rarely does the uh, preflop caller just donk in with top set or something like that because you know that if, I, if you check I'm likely to bet and now especially when the stack to pot ratio is like 3 or something where there's I don't know 200 in the pot and there's 700 behind it's like even if I check back the flop you can bet 150 on the turn and if I call there's 500 in the middle and you can just shove the river so it becomes very unbelievable when you take that line now you could try to do it with like top set and try to level me into calling you with something but again it's just you, you still would just be better off checking and then if I check back you can start value betting um, and uh, so yeah it just that was a, I think a bad lead and I think for right now until you understand what makes a good donk bet, and how to donk bet, how to balance a donk betting range, and why you typically don't want to just, you know, I did a whole entire video lot on, and that was a misclick by the way, I didn't realize the price that I was getting, um, that's another big leak I think you have in your game, Chris, is that your uh, three bets are too small. Now when the stacks get a little bit shallower, and you start min raising when we have like, I don't know, 10 big blinds and 20 big blinds effective, um, even 25 or maybe even like 30 big blinds it becomes a little more sensical to make these min raises uh, but if I'm paying attention I'm like never going to fold to you when you min raise as a 3 bet and so you're just bloating a pot out of position if you have a bluff you're not going to get me to fold usually if I'm paying attention and if you have a value hand you're obviously not getting max value from the hands in my range that I am going to want to call with and I usually do want to call as pre-flop raiser in position um, with a little depth. Um, if you 3x, you just make a lot more money with your range, your three betting range, assuming you uh, construct your three betting range correctly. And you could say, yeah, but like, what if I have a very marginal hand, like a queen jack, um, if I three bet big, then I'm wasting it because you're not going to call me and say, yeah, uh, with anything worse, right? I'd say, well, first of all, I might, you know, uh, Jack 10 suited. There, there will be some worse hands that I might call you with there for deep enough. But secondly, what that really points to is the fact that you probably should not be three betting hands that, like Queen Jack, where it's going to be unlikely that you get called by hands that you're ahead of, and it's going to be unlikely that you get called or that you get me to fold hands that are stronger than yours. Uh, so a better way to construct a three betting range 
<clears throat> is either to go linear and depolar, which means you're just going to select like some cusp hand, like maybe uh, king 10 suited, maybe queen jack suited, um, and pocket sevens, um, maybe like ace eight suited, ace nine offsuit. Three bet those hands and everything better than those hands. Or the other way would be to construct a polarized three betting range, uh, which tends to work better when you're in position, which obviously won't be the case in a heads up match. Um, but if you're going to polarize a three betting range, then you're just going to take the hands that are strong enough to three bet and get called by worse hands and um, balance that out by including enough bluffs um, with hands that are usually you want to use hands that are just barely not strong enough to call for value um, and that are going to either offer blockers to the hands I'm likely to continue with like an ace four suited an ace five suited makes a good light three bet um, because it blocks the ace x combos like it removes some of the ace x from my range um, and it flops okay against the hands that I might call you with like my pocket eights and nines and stuff <clears throat> and it'll see bet well it'll barrel well uh, and the other way to construct your three bet range um, or the the other way to decide or the other let's see the other types of hands you may want to include in the bluff portion of your three betting range if you're three betting a polarized range um, would be to use like the suited connectors that aren't sh quite strong enough to uh, to flat call with um, the uh, speculative hands the like hands like maybe eight six off suit and eight five suited and you know king ten suited or I'm sorry king two suited um, you know uh, I've gotten into that subject a lot in other videos so okay so here um, uh, I think I don't remember how this hand played out but I remember uh, you missed the value but yeah but see that was super thin like you'd have to put me exactly on 8x or like a small pocket pair to make that value bet uh, on one hand but on the other hand I think really if you're thinking through my range and thinking through the way I played the hand it probably would have been possible to put me on exactly the type of hand that I had and maybe if you made like um, a pretty small bet like maybe just shy of half pot or even half pot offering you three to one uh, where I'm like at the top of my range but it's also the bottom of my range because I'm playing my hand so face up uh, you could probably put me in a pretty big bind by betting some hands there and uh, since you also aren't going to have a ton of strong hands that 9x might have been uh, a hand that made sense to make a small value bet with. I think it would have been a really good bet. I definitely don't fault you for not making that bet. Tough bet to make. Um, but I do think it would have been a really good bet. To punish me for playing face up, you know. Okay, so 5 4 offsuit we open. And villain folds. Okay, now I've really got to be careful with my opens because I've got a stack that it really sucks to raise and then fold. Okay, and um, if he min raises, I jam, and he limps, and that's the good. That he's making the right adjustment, Chris. This is the right adjustment when we get down to stack sizes that are so small. Uh, because if you open raise three times the big blind and I shove, that sucks for you. Even if you min raise and I shove, um, I've just got a really easy shove. My uh, stack size is just perfect for making a reshove against a 3x or even a min raise type uh, open. And there's not a lot you can do to stop me from shoving a wide range and making a lot of money. So opening a limping range at these stack sizes makes a tremendous amount of sense. You know, now that we're like under 20 big blinds effective, <clears throat> I would say that's probably the right time to start opening um, a limping range is right around 20 big blinds. Okay, so you limp, and I ship it, as I'm obviously going to do with pocket sixes. I, I just don't know how else I would play them with the stack size. And you turn over sevens, and I don't know if I love your limp with sevens here. Um, it worked out. But the problem is, is that when you limp in like that, you're going to induce me 
a lot. And pocket sevens is not a good hand to induce with because so many of the hands that I would fold had you jammed yourself, um, have so much equity against you when you limp and get shoved on. So like, if, um, you know, let's say I'm sitting there with like, I don't know, 10, eight offsuit and you jam, I can't call. Uh, but if you limp, I may well jam. And now you're in a coin flip where you could have just taken the pot down. Um, so there's the downside. And uh, I just don't think there's an awful lot of upside. Like limping, and if I, if you limp pocket sevens and I've got you know 15 big blinds or something, and I just check, um, that's not great. You know, like it's uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll come back to that or discuss it. Uh, I, I don't know, I've talked a lot about that in different strategy videos, and I know that you've not watched them, but I know that a lot of my audience has, so, um, yeah. So, yeah, this is me just discussing, like, it doesn't make sense for us to play, because I'm doing this bankroll challenge thing, run it up from nothing part two. Um, so, for anybody that hasn't seen it, um, I cashed out everything, had nothing but frequent player points, uh, used them to buy into a tournament, made $2.89, 59 cents or something like that <clears throat> and then gradually rolled it up to just over $500 cashed that out and again uh, had nothing but frequent player points and I'm trying to roll that back up and right now I'm at $20 I was a lot higher and I had some uh, some I, I'd like to see night of variance okay now this is a misclip too like that we're talking and I'm not paying attention I'm looking at my hearts and not the fact that I have second pair um, I think second pair is always a call against a donk bet in that spot, but especially against this guy, we know is donking uh, a bluff heavy, semi bluff heavy range, um, and I have like you know second pair. No way I should be folding to a half pot uh, bet on the flop. You know, getting three to one, being in position, that was a really really terrible fold. And I did do that on accident. I just uh, just misread my hand. It's like I was so thinking about making a move, looking for like a backdoor straight flush draw or something to get crazy with, and I saw that like my uh, my my cards weren't making any straights, and I didn't have the suits, and then I just was like, ah, forget it, we'll wait for a better spot, and just as I was folding, realized that I had flopped a pair and folded to a half pot donk, bet, which you don't want to do, typically. It seems pretty bad. So that was a bummer. Okay, this I think is an interesting spot. I believe you limped this hand, and I've got a tough decision. Uh, I, I think I could raise, and you've been so uh, uh, limp fold happy that it makes some sense. But my hand plays so good, I don't know that I want to waste it. So it's really close. So here I check to you, and you bet my call with top pair. Um, I check again, and you bet. And of course, again, I'm going to have to call with top pair and a you know, reasonable kicker. I am starting to run out of jacks that I can beat, but I expect you're going to bet a lot when I check to you. Um, and here the flush comes in, and I think you rep the flush draw better than I do, and some straights have come in, and you definitely rep those better than I do. Because I'm not going to like double peel 4-6. Oh yeah, that would have been an open ended straight draw. So I don't know, I think I can have straights, I can have flushes, but you have more of them. So if you bet a bigger size in here, I think I can fold. But because I'm getting um, three to one pot odds, I've got to call with most of my range. Um, unless something, I mean, this card is not terrible uh, for me. Um, and because it's not actually terrible for me, uh, I, I think I still have to call with most of the range that I get to that spot with. Now, if the card is particularly bad for me, then of course I... Um, I don't need to, uh, you know, just pay you off and get stubborn when the uh, equity distributions change dramatically. Um, but I just think if I fold top pair in that spot, um, you're probably going to be able to make a profit by just betting your entire range. So here I go for the check on the flop because I think my hand's perfect for checking and calling. I've got showdown value against your air, and I can bluff catch easily. And even if you have a value hand that wants to bet, I've got equity. Hopefully I can induce a bluff somewhere along the way. Um, and I think it's really good to have flush draws in our range that check and don't get aggressive. 
so that when we do check back and the third diamond comes in, our opponent can't just overbet the pot uh, on the turn and like overbet jam the river and we can never call. So I think it's good to have some flushes in our range when we're checking. And I also think uh, uh, just having that showdown value with a pair of sixes is good. Um, it's good to have pairs in our range when we check back. So um, in a spot where you know, we have um, like a combo draw where our pair is not strong enough to get value from second best pairs and uh, we've got a draw. Um, I, I just think there's a lot of upside to checking and calling. It does a lot of good things for our overall strategy. Okay, so here I've got second pair with three to a straight flush, a Broadway straight flush. So I uh, have to call flop. Um, but I think when we get to the turn here, um, 9, 10, jack, yeah, I think we're, it's real close. Um, but sometimes even when we hit our queen on the river, it's going to be the wrong queen, and we're going to lose a bunch of money. So I think that's fine to uh, check and fold. Alright, so here, um, I'm having a little technical difficulty. Um, <clears throat> not sure if you can hear me, but here I'm checking back bottom pair. I think that's pretty standard. Uh, yeah, so, it, okay, the way this hand played out, it looks to me like Chris has exactly an ace or like a three. And uh, so I think if I size my bet small enough, I can get value from him. Uh, he can have a worse four, he can have a three, and he can have like ace high. I think all those hands make a lot of sense. <clears throat> and then I start typing into the text box, here you always have ace high or three X or something like that. Just ready to, to hit that return button and just show off my poker chops. Um, this is similar to a hand I played a while back where the guy ended up like jamming on me and I snapped it off because it made like no sense. Um, but this is the kind of thin value bet that when we know how our opponent's playing, we think he's playing a style that makes sense. He's, he understands showdown value. He knows how to kind of polarize his uh, aggression. Um, we can put him on a pretty good... Um, uh, I mean, a pretty, you can, very often, he narrow his range down pretty specifically, and if we're paying attention and we're ranging our opponent, this is the price our opponent pays uh, for playing decent poker. Um, but it's also the price our opponent pays for not balancing his range out a little bit better by including traps and slow plays in with his showdown value hands and for not turning some of his uh, weaker showdown value into bluffs. So I think that uh, the default line, like the line he took with his hand, I think was perfectly legitimate. It's the exact line I would have taken against a fish. But once he realized he's not playing against a fish, he probably should kind of mix things up a little bit. And we can talk about ways to do that. Um, it's kind of hard for me to do that because I'm narrating while I'm watching and I don't know how to pause it without like stopping everything. Um, but here was another misclick. I'm, I'm not paying attention. I'm like fiddling around with the text and not realizing that I'm pre-flop caller. So I donked in and he three bought me and I had top pair. So I called. Um, so it kind of worked out um, that I kind of misclicked and just donked into him for no reason. It was a mistake and uh, I, it's not going to be the best play most of the time, but I think I made at least as much money uh, as I would have betting flop, betting turn, and betting river. Um, I may have got three streets paid off, um, but I would have had to size my bets right. He had a combo draw. Uh, he had a flush draw and then picked up a pair on the turn. Um, so he raised me with the flush draw. and uh, Yeah, so I think what happens if I play it kind of standard is I check call flop, um, I check call turn, and then I maybe lead the river, but if I go for the check raise, and then he's probably just gonna check back, and I think, yeah, I think probably actually I made more money playing it the wrong way. So I did like the wrong thing at the right time, and sometimes that happens. There's lots of different types of uh, luck in poker. Sometimes luck hangs out in weird places. Um, but yeah, that time the line worked out good. Um, it was the first time I ever donked into him. Uh, it was clearly on his board. You know what I mean? Like, he had a range advantage on that flop. 
And so I think he did absolutely the right thing. I think that's a great raise. If you see somebody just take off and donk lead into you when you're pre-flop raiser and the board comes out king rag rag and you have a draw, absolutely you want to raise. Absolutely. So I think he played the hand just fine. It was just a weird batch of weird luck. Okay, now when he donks an ace king king, I just think he's full of it 120% of the time. He has no incentive to bet a legitimate hand on that flop because he should know damn well that if he checks, I am betting that flop every single time. I'm going to make a range bet with just about every hand I have. I may even have bet pocket nines on that board. Um, so it might look like a little bit of a speedy call down, but I went with the read that is, first of all, there's a population read and just a read you can make on players in general that when they donk bet, they're usually donking with a weaker hand. Uh, second, you can go with the read that um, we have seen Chris donk bet with draws and air. And um, third, that is a board that is so absolutely suspect that we should be a little bit more... Well, it's like if I had air, I should raise him on that board, right? So um, I'm just never folding. Uh, if I have any kind of equity at all, like say, even if I had just a queen and three to a flush, I'm raising. And if I have absolutely nothing, I might like at least peel and just see if he checks the turn and I can take it away. And if I've got something more in the middle of my range, then I'm gonna call down. And it might, again, look spewy, but I'm gonna expect a lot of players to donk that hands like pocket twos, Queen Jack, Queen Ten on that board. I'm not going to expect him to donk a king because why on earth would he donk by a king when he knows damn well if he checks I'm going to bet, right? Uh, same thing with an ace. If he has an ace, of course he's not going to donk. He's going to check and call for sure um, because why turn his ace? Like if he has a, a weak ace that wasn't you know, super strong, uh, like not strong enough to three bet at preflop, uh, maybe a hand like ace six. If he donks into me, and if I'm not kind of playing the meta game, it's sort of like he's trying to turn his hand into a bluff. Like, you know, if he's not expecting me to call him down with pocket nines, then what is he expecting to happen when he bets like ace six on ace king king into the preflop raiser? Like, he's either going to get raised and be in a tough spot, or he's going to get called and be in a tough spot. Um, and. I just have such a monster range advantage. That's the one thing about donking. Um, if you're going to start donk betting some hands, if you're going to try to work a donk range into your heads up game, um, watch my video on it and watch like my T-Talk series. That's the Dow of C betting. I think you'll uh, get some insights out of that. Um, and I'm going to go back and look and see if I've actually made uh, a video on nothing but donk betting. I believe I have, but if not, I'm going to. Um, but you basically want to be in a spot where the, the following things are true. Number one, you do not expect your opponent to see bat the board very often. And number two, you have a range advantage. And number three, you have a hand that wants to do this. So, um, <clears throat> of course, your opponent's important too. Uh, but just very basically, if you can imagine, um, let's say you're in a normal poker game, like you're playing six max, higher stakes, and you raise, and your opponent three bets you, and you call, or even better, let's go with this, um, you open the button, and your opponent three bets out of the big blind. No, that's not going to work, damn it. Okay, let's say you, there's a limper from middle position, and you ISO raise to like four and a half times the big blind, uh, 100 big blinds deep in a six max uh, game online, and the big blind flat calls. The other guy folds, and the flop comes out like seven, eight, nine, two tone. Okay, so now, or let's even make it worse than that. Let's say it's uh, nine, 10, jack. Let's go with 8, 9, 10, 2-tone. Final answer. So if um, 
there's a limper, the button, hero's the button, hero iso raises, and uh, the guy in the big blind flat calls, and the initial the initial open limper folds, uh, and then the flop comes out eight, nine, ten, two tone. So um, the guy that flat calls out of the big blind should be all over that board, right? He's gonna have like uh, all maybe all of his sets. He may just have a second and bottom set. He may three bet top set pre flop, but he'll have most of his set combos. He'll have a ton of top pairs. He'll have a ton of two pairs. He'll have a ton of combo draws. He'll have a ton of draws, and he's going to have more of the nuts because Queen Jack suited, maybe Queen Jack off suit, probably going to make up a bigger percent of his range than it would the buttons ISO raising range. Because the button may just overlap Queen Jack, and even if he does ISO raise, he's going to be ISO raising more hands than the big blind is flat calling with. Um, so the percentage of the nuts is going to be higher in uh, villains big blind flat calling range than it will be in heroes ISO raising from the button range. Um, so because uh, the villain in the big blind has more uh, good hands, more mediocre hands, more nutted value hands, and more draws, and the player that is the hero that did the ISO raise is going to have a lot less huge hands. Um, that's a spot where a lot of good players are going to make a range check. In other words, they're going to check back their entire range. And if you know your opponent is going to check back their entire range, then you know, even if I have aces in that spot, I'm checking it back. The big blind checks, I'm checking aces back. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But number one is because I'm beat so often, you know. Uh, number two is uh, if I get check raised, and my if my opponent's any good, he's going to be able to check raise me wide, and I'm just never going to be able to call. Um, so if we're in a spot like that where the guy that's in position is at a range disadvantage, then we know he's going to check back a lot of hands. Well, what does that mean? That means that the preflop caller now has the initiative. He should be the one that's leading the flop. So that's a spot where you'd want to have a donk betting range because I want to be able to get three streets of value when I do have the nuts. I don't want to let my opponent pot control by checking back his entire range. Um, and because my range is so strong in that situation, I want to have some three barrel bluffs that are going to be able to apply maximum pressure on the top of my opponent's range or to the, you know, the top of his folding range. Um, so yeah, basically when you're in a spot where your opponent is likely to check the flop back very often, um, that's a spot where you can consider opening up a uh, donk betting range. Uh, outside of that I wouldn't do it. And in micro stakes and low stakes, heads up, sit and goes, I wouldn't do it at all uh, because your opponents are almost universally at these stakes going to be uh, C betting way too frequently. And as long as they're C betting more often than they ought to, then you should check to them and allow them to C bet because that's how you're going to make the most money with your range overall. Um, we're running pretty long here. I'm not going to go into it any deeper than that, but hopefully I got the point basically across. So thanks for the uh, heads up matches. I think they were good games. Uh, seems like you understand poker. You have good card sense, but let's work on our three bet sizing. Maybe three bet range construction. Not too sure about that. And let's clean those donk bets up. Uh, I think you lost the game by donk betting incorrectly. I think that was, uh, if you took all of your bad donk bets out, uh, we're still playing, you know? Like, we're probably even. So, work on those things, and I think you'll improve your game a lot. So, until next time, boys and girls, Navanad over and out good, quote, L-U-C-K, exclamation point, end quote. Over and out. I don't know how to stop this.